Welcome to our live webinar, Secure Transactions Under UCC Article 9, A Practical Approach, that is taking place on Tuesday, May 14th, 2024. My name is Aisha Stewart and I will be your moderator. Please note, following today's webinar, there will be a few evaluation questions that I will share with you. Our presenter today is Lydia Dunstein, Transactional Business Consultant for CT Corporation. Please note that a copy of the slides from the presentation is available in the handout section, which is right next to the Q&A box. There are also several related resources included there for your reference. Without further ado, I would like to turn it over to Lydia. Welcome, Lydia. Thank you so much, Aisha, and hello, everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I usually handle a lot of education here on the West Coast. I'm down here in Southern California, born and raised, although my parents are from Mexico and Holland, and I, I like to spend a lot of time down there. Well, let's get started on secure transactions, and my approach today is really a practical approach. Certainly, we'll be talking about the laws, but I also want you to be familiarized with how things really happen um, on the front line, so to speak. So we'll talk a little bit about the background of Article 9 of the UCC, and especially for those that are beginners, and this is an introductory course. And then we'll get into the cycle of a secure transaction, some of the issues that, that are faced there. We'll also discuss how to file a UCC financing statement and how to search the record. Now, filing and searching do go hand in hand and they sort of cross over each other. So when we talk about filing, we'll probably overlap a little bit in searching too. So let's look at this picture here. They say that a picture is worth a thousand words. Here's this young person holding what I think is a robot that he's built. And imagine that he wants to expand and make lots of different robots. Well, he could go to a bank and he could pledge his collateral, which is that robot there, because a robot that's not attached to anything is most likely gonna be classified as personal property. And that's really kind of what we're going to be talking about today. But before we get into the details, I do want to make sure all of you are aware of the who's who in the Uniform Commercial Code. There are five organizations that are really involved with creating committees, writing laws, updating laws, creating publications for your educational use, practical use. And uh, those are listed here. You can look at their websites. I would recommend that you go on their mailing lists so that you can learn a little bit more about it. I know IACA, they're the ones that they're in charge of the forms and they just recently updated the forms as we'll discuss a little later. They're having their big conference uh, next week, I believe in Detroit, uh, which is a really big event and uh, something that you may wanna consider getting involved with if you end up doing a lot more work in this area of law. So in terms of the background of Article 9, the Uniform Commercial Code is actually a model code, and we know there are a lot of model codes out there. This particular model code is adopted by all of the 50 states and outlying jurisdictions. Uh, the, generally, Article 9 does contain all of the rules and procedures governing what's called security interests in personal property, in other words, where a lender as long as they follow certain procedures that we'll get to a little bit later, they will have a security interest in the robot, for example, with that young person. And it also involves the security interest in fixtures. Fixtures. We won't be getting into uh, what a fixture is today. We have a separate presentation on that. So Article 9 is part of the, the code, the model code, and it went through a major overhaul back in 2001. Maybe some of you are familiar with those changes. It also went through some major revisions in 2010, which included all the forms being revamped. And then last year, as I mentioned, there were a few minor amendments to the forms. If you want more information about that, you're more than welcome to, mention me, to message me. However, I will say that they weren't like super substantive. Some of the changes were mostly about the directions. And like, so for example, at the top of the UCC one, you won't, wouldn't say filer, you would say submitter instead of filer, things like that. 
And then it is important to understand that there is also a model administrative rule which was promulgated and it for use by the various filing offices. And most of the time the filing offices are called the Secretary of State's office, although we have different names for them depending on which jurisdiction you're talking about. They're not always called the Secretary of State, but in any event, those particular rules are found on the IACA's website. You can read them, become familiar with them. One of the practice pointers I want to, you to take away today is if you don't have access to one of the research tools that is a subscription type service, you can always look at the Uniform Commercial Code on the Cornell website. It also includes links to each of the state's different commercial codes. And I say different, and I'll, I'll show you what I mean by different, because even though we say that the Uniform Commercial Code is uniform, as you'll see in a second, it, it really isn't. What do I mean by that? Well, let's look at this little pinwheel that I created. Now, by no means does it show every single thing that might make the Uniform Commercial Code ununiform, but I want to focus on some of these items because they are important in terms of making sure, especially if you are a secured party or you, you are an attorney representing a secured party, to understand some of these ununiform issues so that you can be a better practitioner. Let's start at the top right with the use of the forms. As I mentioned before, the forms have changed several times over the past 20 years. Now, if you don't use the right form for the right jurisdiction, that could be a reason for your UCC1 filing to be rejected. And that's not a situation that you want to be in. More on that later. There's also some variations with what is required to actually be on the form. So for example, in Florida and in Tennessee, there's specific information that's required under those specific states uniform commercial code that requires a stamp tax information. Now what happens if you don't have a stamp tax? That's another reason for getting rejected. You don't want that to happen. Let's move on to the next piece of pinwheel here. What about the adoption of the UCC section? Now, even though I told you that all 50 states have adopted some, you know, have adopted the actual model code, the UCC, Article 9, there are lots of variations within those provisions. And you've got to be aware of that because when you're starting to work on a deal, you want to make sure that you have figured out the choice of law for your particular fact scenario and that you open up the statute and you start reading what the provisions say and what's required of you. Uh, one of the examples I'll give to you is that the states were allowed to adopt two different alternatives for deciding what name to put, what individual name to put on a UCC1. And I'll show you about that a little later as well. They, um, and the next section is the filing office. As I mentioned before, filing offices don't always, aren't always called the Secretary of State's office. In D.C., it's called the Register of Deeds, for example. In Georgia, it is a central filing index. In Louisiana, you will file in the parish, and so on. Now, with e-filing, it's become a little bit more popular lately. I know some of you are still a little hesitant. Hopefully, um, I can distill some of your fears there. But e-filing is, is not possible in every jurisdiction. It is a great way to try and get your evidence back quickly, but You'll need to look and see, is it mandatory or not? In Colorado, it is. Is it optional? If, it, if e filing is available, can you attach exhibits, for example? So that really makes the, the issue of ununiformity a problem when it comes to e filing. Now, what about search logic? Each of the states are allowed to adopt whatever search logic they, they agree to. And that means that you're going to have variations in your search results. So for example, a search result with one name could produce different results in one jurisdiction than in another. And there's a couple cases where I'll point that out too. The types of searches vary by jurisdiction as well. Um, some jurisdictions only provide for certified searches, which means you have to use the exact name of the debtor in order to search. And others, 
jurisdictions like California allow for a broad-based search, which means that you may end up with a lot of different output, a lot of different uh, UCCs that may not be relevant to your particular deal, but it's a good way to get a bigger picture and hopefully pick up some of those liens that you may not have picked up on in a certified search. And I will also say that a certified search is sort of analogous to what I would call an Article 9 compliant search. More on that a little later as well. Okay, so the, applic the applicability of Article 9 is really what type of transaction does Article 9 apply to? And under the code 9109, Section 9109, Article 9 applies to transactions that create security interests in personal property, like the robot, or fixtures by contract. And it's important to note that this means that it has to be a consensual lien, okay? And it also applies to agricultural liens. We won't be getting into that today. Also in involves the sale of accounts, chattel paper, payment intangibles, and promissory notes or consignment agreements, maybe you didn't know that you can actually file a UCC-1 if you take your couch in, an expensive couch, you may want to consider doing that because the consignment store could actually sell the couch from under you, and how do you get that back? You can use this process that way. There's also certain other security interests under these other articles that are listed there that we will not be getting into today as well. Today, we're going to focus on security interests in personal property. So what is personal property? Well, I already gave you the example of the robot. And if you look at the picture there, you'll see that that looks like a construction site. And it uh, looks like there might be even a piece of equipment sitting there that would be considered, probably um, be considered personal property. And all those construction materials are considered personal property. Uh, the hats would be considered personal property. The computer is computer is personal property as well. It's really the property that is an asset that is other than real estate. Um, there are some exceptions to that. And uh, again, we're not going to get into that today. But um, fixtures are personal property until they become fixtures. Okay. So in other words, that construction material there is personal property until it's attached to the building. And in some cases, like the toilets and the sinks and things like that do become classified as fixtures later. Now, what are some practice pointers that I want you to think about when you're looking at the beginning of a deal transaction? What property is the debtor going to be pledging? Where is the property located? Is it here in the United States? Is it in another country? Does securing the collateral fall outside of or cross over into Article 9 such that there might be other systems out there? Let's get into that a little bit more here. So there are other lien registries that exist for specific types of personal property. That means that one may need to hire counsel or an attorney to deal with that particular aspect of the transaction because it has its own set of laws. You may need a specialist. Here are some examples of some of the other lien systems. Aircraft liens have to be registered with the Federal Aviation Administration. We do see a lot of uh, UCC ones in, uh, you know, under Article 9 filed in the registry systems at the Secretary of State's office on the engines, for example. So that would be a good example of how this particular system crosses over into the UCC. Um, and intellectual property also kind of crosses over, but if the assets, if those intellectual property assets are high value, then it may be a good idea to actually go into the USPTO's office, look at what the rules are for making sure that you secure a lien there and give notice there. Again, it has its own process. We're talking about trademarks and, and patents and things like that. Boats and vessels and motor vehicles, real property, they all each have their own separate registry systems as well as their own sets of laws to be aware of. Now, just keep these other registries in mind as the secured party ensures that you secure all of these assets. Article 9 does not apply to non-consensual liens. And I said this earlier in the opposite way, which is or in a similar way. 
Article 9 really only applies to that contract, those consensual liens where the debtor agrees to the pledge of collateral, agrees that the secured party will have the security interest in these personal properties. But I still want you to be aware of some of these other non-consensual liens because sometimes they're found in the same index or the same registry as the UCC liens. And some examples will include federal and state tax liens, judgment liens. Um, I'll give you an example in California in a minute. And then there's separate registries for hospital liens, mechanics liens, ERISA liens, and environmental protection act liens. Article nine does not apply to these examples that I'm showing you here. As a practice pointer, one of the issues that comes up a lot, because when you're searching, you're in this mode that you want to use the correct debtor name, but all of these different lien holders that are listed here do not necessarily have to follow Article 9 rules. They don't have to follow the name rules as found in Article 9, which means that sometimes we have to broaden our searches, the names of our searches, in order to pick up on these liens just something to be aware of as you navigate through this. And we have a whole nother presentation on this for another time. Okay, so this is a really handy chart. Many of you probably have seen it before. I know I try to send it to all of my customers here out west. And it's called a lien locator smart chart. What it does is it shows where the UCC liens are found, but it also includes those typical non-consensual liens that we see a lot of our customers ordering on a daily basis. And what do those include? Those include UCC fixture filings. At the top of the chart there, you can see federal tax liens, state tax liens, and judgment liens. So if I were getting an assignment where I had to do a lien search or um, I needed to file my UCC one, maybe in California, let's pick California you'll see that the UCC liens are found at the state. And we do have a listing actually of all the different offices. If you wanted that, you could always message us. The UCC filing for fixtures are found at the county and that makes sense because those are really related to real estate. And for most of you who've bought a house know that all those records are in the recorder's office at the county. But look at the federal state tax liens and judgment liens. You'll see that those are found not only at the state level, but also at the county level. So if you order a UCC search in California, you are automatically going to be picking up those other non-consensual liens when you search for UCC, which kind of helps because then that means it's just one search that you'll have to order. Um, it's good to be aware of when, what jurisdiction you're in and determine you know, which, where the liens are found and so that you can make sure that you cover everything. You would hate to find out post-closing that there's another lien out there. Okay, so this is a bird's eye view of the first slide that, that we saw, which is all those containers that contain, um, I guess, some of my online orders that I don't want to admit that I ordered, but I think most of us are in that habit nowadays, right? Anyway, let's look at secure transactions. And I thought that we would go with a visual here. This is really a simple cycle of what a secure transaction is all about. Let's start at the top left, and you'll see the parties are there. We have a secured party or lenders. There could be one, there could be more than one, depending on the type of deal it is. And then you'll have the debtor, they're the ones that owe the money. And sometimes, especially when it comes to commercial uh, debtors, like if you have an LLC or a corporation as a debtor, you're most likely going to have an individual or another entity guarantee that loan and in simple terms it's really it's not quite like co-signing but basically the guarantor signs an agreement that says if the debtor doesn't pay then we will pay now if we look at the cycle let's start with the first piece of uh, the first process which is the due diligence piece and that's where the credit committee maybe it's a bank that's going to be loaning money to the young person at the beginning of the slide for his robots, they're going to check his credit, they're going to check, um, they may, maybe he has an LLC, they'll check the down at Bradstreet and so forth. They're going to search the record, they may search for UCCs, they'll also search for those other non-consensual liens that we discussed, 
in the negotiation stage, they're going to try to decide what collateral is going to be pledged and so on. The next stage is the documentation stage. What does that mean? Well, in most secure transactions, you're going to see what's called a security agreement. And you will have to have certain provisions contained in it. There are lots of forms out there. I would imagine if you work for a law firm, there's standard provisions. But again, remember, variations in states. And that's something you'll have to open the statute and figure out. You'll also have a promissory note, which is that promise to pay signed by the debtor and the guarantee that's signed by those guarantors that I mentioned. And last but not least, there will be a UCC1 form that must be authorized by, by the debtor. And maybe some of you are already aware, the debtor can actually authorize the UCC1 even during the due diligence stage before all of the agreements have been signed in ink. You just have to remember that if the deal falls through and the deal you know, doesn't go forward, you're gonna to have to probably terminate that UCC one and, and more on that a little bit later. Now, depending on the type of deal, there are additional documents that are probably gonna be necessary. So for example, in real estate, we have the deed of trust or the mortgage, and we also have an assignment of rents, uh, but that's beyond the scope of this particular presentation today. Next in the cycle is the notice and perfection. What do I mean by that? Well, the secured party is obliged not only to make sure that the filing of the, of the, of the UCC document is authorized, but it also has to be filed in a pro the proper jurisdiction and, again, containing those special provisions that Florida might ask for, like the stamp tax and so forth. This particular process means if it's done correctly, that the secured party has perfected its security interest in the property. The next phase is the post-closing phase. And uh, having talked to a lot of clients over the years, I find that sometimes people sort of forget about this part. So I want to emphasize that it is a very important part of the process, especially if you are in the secured party's shoes, or if you're an attorney representing the secured party. Why? Well, we need to make sure that in phase three, that the UCC was in fact giving proper notice. And the way to do that is to order a post-closing UCC search to reflect, which means that we followed all the rules, the jurisdiction, the filing office did not make any mistakes, and we are good to go. And it's a great thing to put in your closing binder as well as evidence that we did everything the right way. Um, we also want to find out who is responsible for docketing or, as we say, tickling the lap state. Every UCC has some type of expiration date, depending on the type of deal it is. Most of the time, with personal property, it's five years, with some exceptions. Okay. Let's move on. Uh, before we do, though, one more thing. At the top right of your screen, you'll see that there is a whole other transaction up there separate from the secure transaction, and that is what happens when the debtor defaults. The secured party has the right to foreclose. Sometimes it's called replevin. There are separate rules and procedures for that. We call that really its own separate transaction with its own set of uh, you know, processes and procedures. But one of the things that, that will happen is you will have to go through the due diligence process and look at everything, look at all the documents as well as the UCC from hindsight's view. And that means you may have to fix things if they weren't done correctly in the, in the first place. And we're seeing a lot of that right now uh, because of the failed banks and so forth. Okay. This is a really good case that kind of gives us the proposition that it is important for the debtor to authorize a UCC-1. And um, I, I kind of, I don't know, you'll have to read the case yourself, but I got the impression that Wallace was, was kind of up to no good here. He bought a 50% interest in a company called Impala from Nava Cruz, and Nava Cruz was still involved in Impala. Uh, the price of the Interest was $25,000, but Wallace didn't have enough money to 
pay the whole amount. So he was paying Nava as they went. He paid 16000 of the 25000 and then wasn't happy with the way Nava Cruz was managing this business. So he stopped paying. Now, when they did the transaction at the beginning of the two parties, Nava and Wallace did sign a bill of sale. And they also signed an operating agreement to run the, I think it was a limited liability company. Later, when, after Wallace left and, uh, you know, sort of broke up with Nava, Impala acquired a liquor license. Then Wallace found out about it and tried to file a UCC-1 against Impala, even though it, it's kind of strange because Wallace is the one who owes money to Nava, but apparently Nava didn't file a UCC against Wallace. That's a whole other case, I, I would imagine. In any event, Wallace files a UCC and he describes the collateral as all tangible and intangible equipment, including a liquor license. Well, when Nava Cruz discovered this, he sent a demand letter as required under UCC 9527 and asked Wallace to terminate the UCC-1. He refused to do so. This suit ensued. The question for the court was, can a bill of sale and an operating agreement act as authority or consent to file a UCC-1 against the debtor? Now, uh, by the way, this is an unpublished opinion in Arizona. Uh, there was no legal precedent in terms of, you know, d does a member of a company of an LLC have the right to file a UCC-1 against the the LLC for, you know, his investment, basically. He's trying to get his twenty-five or $16,000 back. He's not going to get the twenty-five because he didn't pay it all. Well, um, the, the judge said, no, this the bill of sale and the operating agreement did not create an authorization. It didn't have the proper language, and they did not classify it as a security agreement. Um, Wallace had tried to rely on this phrase in the operating agreement that said, each member shall look solely to the assets of the company for the return of its capital contribution. Well, that doesn't mean that you have that there is an authorization to file a UCC-1. Uh, this is really a question of uh, LOC law, not of uh, Article 9 law. And uh, the court further went on to say that an acquiring interest in a company does not automatically grant authority to file UCC documents. Therefore, Wallace was liable under 9527 uh, for damages. And um, remember, 9509 provides that a person may file a financing statement only if authorized via an authenticated record which would have been, you know, some kind of a writing and, or a security agreement. Maybe a few of you haven't seen the UCC-1 financing statement before, so I wanted to show you a copy of it. I realize it's a little bit small, um, but again, if you, if you want to see a copy of it, uh, we're ha happy to send it to you, although you could probably Google it in five seconds. And um, what do I want to say about the financing statement? Well, it is a record or records, and I say records because it, it also includes the UCC-3 amendment, which I'll talk to you about later. And um, it is filed with the proper jurisdiction. It also includes all of the exhibits that might be attached there too. Now, what makes the UCC-1 financing statement effective? It has to be provide the debtor name, and that's the most important element. If there's nothing else that you remember today, it's that you've got to get the debtor name correct. You also have to have the secured party information. You know, of course, the addresses too. And there has to be an indication of collateral. Now, there's a lot of case law about fighting over what is proper indication of collateral. That's also saved for another presentation. We just don't have time for it today. Acceptance of the new form from last year has been a very hot topic, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention it to you. Things have settled down a little bit, but I think it's important that we discuss it. First of all, there's really three forms that are floating out there. First, there's the pre-2011 form. The only jurisdictions that, taking that, that will only accept that form is New York. They won't accept any other form 
they won't accept the 11 form, they won't accept the 23 form. Why? Well, they haven't updated their computer system yet, okay? Now, how do you make sure that you get the right form? And by the way, if you don't remember I said at the beginning, you gotta get the right form, otherwise your filing risks rejection. And in jurisdictions that take a long time, like California, you don't wanna wait two years, two, not two years, two weeks, after you submitted your filing to find out that it's rejected. That doesn't look good on uh, attorneys who are representing secured parties. So it is a good idea to either rely on a good service provider to help you figure that out, or you could always go to the state's website, download the correct form, and so forth. Now, I, I, I don't want to belabor the point about the Florida stamp tax, as we already mentioned that before. But I do want to mention something that I think will help you in this process of figuring out which jurisdiction accepts which form. And so I'm going to show you a handy chart that you can use uh, by, by CT. And it's basically a, a 2023 UCC forms adoption. It was just updated, I think, on May 9th. It's in your materials. Definitely download it and print it out. And I'll just guide you through one of the examples, or two examples. First of all, you'll see that the state is on the left, similar to the last chart that we looked at. And then it's going to say, will the new UCC national forms be accepted? Notice that Colorado only allows online filing. So no, they're not going to accept any forms at all. You have to e-file there. And if, and as opposed to California, which yes, they are accepting the new forms. If yes, when will the form acceptance begin? Well, it's already begun. We're good. Will the current UCC national forms continue to be accepted? Yes, they will. In other words, uh, the, the old one from 2011. And then if so, will, when will the current national form no longer be accepted? Well, right now, we're still accepting it in California. And again, you can get that in your materials, okay? All right, so in general, as I mentioned that the UCC is really a notice system, okay? And the form was adopted in all the 50 states. We know that there's variations. We know we have to pay attention to that. And what the UCC does is it gives notice to the whole world that's searching public records, that some type of secure transaction may exist. Once the UCC is filed, it becomes part of the searchable record and properly filing that UCC-1 perfects the security interest in the collateral or you know, in the personal property. Once that filing is done, that means that the secured party gains priority over other lien creditors. What do I mean by that? Well, you can think of Article 9 UCCs as sort of a, a line, people sitting in line. And secured creditors want to be first in line. They don't want to be second or third or fourth because when that foreclosure happens, the further you are in the back of the line, the less money you're going to get in the end. And I know I'm oversimplifying that. It's also important to note that, and by the way, there's lots and lots of fights about priority in the courts. And um, I guess we can maybe do a whole presentation on that too. Generally speaking, the effective period of UCC-1 as it relates to personal property is five years. But there are other transactions that go longer. Which ones are those? Some examples include public finance transactions, manufactured homes. Those are usually 30 years. They last 30 years with some variations. If you're doing, if you're a secured party and you're filing UCC-1, on what's called a transmitting utility, that would be like a railroad or someone in the business of some type of utility, then those filings will last until they're terminated, until a UCC-3 is filed. The exception to that is Georgia, which is five years. There's also an example of a co-op in New York, which is 50 years, and a case that I'll show you in a minute. What is the practice pointer here? The beginning of a transaction in phase one or phase two, you want to understand the effective period. And in phase four, you want to make sure that you calendar or docket that expiration date so that you don't lose your priority. So this is a case that was uh, filed in the Eastern District of New York. 
they were able to bring it to federal court because Freddie Mac was one of the defendants. So Freddie Mac and CMI were both the secured parties. Plaintiff or debtor borrowed 35,000 from CMI in order to pay for this stock that the debtor bought in this co-op apartment in New York City. What was pledged? What was pledged was the shares in the cooperative stock as well as the lease. And the court had said that these two things really do go hand in hand because they have really no value without the other. Debtor ended up defaulting. The secured parties went through a foreclosure process. They sold the property at, well, the, the rights to the stock, I should say, and the lease at a foreclosure sale. And actually, they were the ones that bought the property at the foreclosure sale. And now debtor is trying to set aside the foreclosure, claiming that the UCC1 had already expired because it had been more than five years since the two secured parties had filed the UCC1. So the question was whether the shares in the co-op are really real property or personal property. The ruling was that the shares and the lease were actually personal property, and there was already authority in New York about that. Articles 8 and 9 did apply. UCC was valid because under 9515 of the New York UCC, it allows for a UCC financing statement covering a cooperative interest to be effective for a period of 50 years. I've never seen that before, by the way, uh, when I found this case. So I, I found that really interesting. Um, and they did everything correctly. They did it by the book. They looked at the statute. They knew that there needed to be an addendum. They filed the addendum simultaneously with the UCC one. That meant that uh, the debtor, uh, Rapio, was really out of luck here and the banks were able to carry on. Earlier I mentioned the UCC three as being part of the record and I want you to have a picture of it, especially if you're new to this area of law. It really does a, a few things. Um, it is part of the record again, so it's important to review the UCC threes when you're looking at searches. Um, let me show you what they what this form actually does. There's four categories of things that that you can do with the UCC three. First of all, there's just the general amendment box that you can check, and what that does is, is it allows for changing information relating to the debtor, the secured party, or the collateral. For those of you who are working on foreclosures right now, it's super important to review the security agreement to see what was actually pledged and compare it to what the UCC1 says and see if there's any discrepancies and then you know, talk to the person in charge and see if any amendments have to be done with the collateral. Uh, and you know, we've seen debtors who are stepping in the shoes of other debtors. That would be another um, example of where you would use this amendment. A continuation, we just talked about, you know, five years um, within six months before the lapse date. If it's a five-year uh, period of time, effective date, you can, you can actually file a continuation six months prior to the lapse date. And you ne definitely never want to wait till the last minute to do that. Why? Sometimes UCC3s get rejected. You would hate to have your UCC rejected um, on the final day. So at least you'll have some time to, to figure it out why it was wrong. Assignments, uh, we've seen a lot of those lately because of those failed banks. New banks are coming in and uh, the, the FDIC is assigning the interest in those failed banks to new banks. Uh, now, I can tell you from my own experience that a lot of times the new banks don't necessarily want to spend the money on doing the, those assignments. Uh, but there's so much technology out there now that it really behooves you to go ahead and do this assignment because you would hate to have someone who is maybe second in line, a secured party second in line or third in line before closing on the same property that's pledged in your security agreement and then you don't get notice of it because they didn't have the right information on how to get a hold of you, for example. The termination is really a document that terminates the security interest in the loan or in the, in the property. It will remain on the record for at least up to one year after the lapse date. And we get this question all the time. Why do my terminations show up on my lien searches? Well, 
is because you have to read them and you have to make sure that they're authorized. And this is a separate issue of authorization. Secure party needs to authorize the termination and actually they need to authorize any of these amendments. So if something looks weird in a UCC3 and you're questioning whether it's correct or not or authorized or not, please take the steps, make further inquiry, get a hold of the secured party on record, and find out the particulars about the particular transaction. Okay, now we're gonna look at a checklist that you can use in the future for uh, some of the bigger issues that are involved when you're filing a UCC1. Gotta get the name right. Got a couple of slides that I'll show you on that in a minute. Gotta get the form right. Review your state laws. We're gonna talk about the, how to determine where to search, how to determine where to file. And sometimes we also may wanna consider name variations back to what I was talking about with those non-consensual liens, and also because with individual debtors, if you're in an alternative B state, uh, then you've got to expand your search a little bit more, and I'll explain that too. Don't forget to dock at that expiration date either. So when it comes to individual debtors, there's a couple of alternatives that can be used depending on what the state adopted and those are alternative A and alternative B. The majority rule is alternative A, and that's called the only if rule. The secured party is perfected only if the filing provides the name on an unexpired driver's license or ID card issued by this state. And if they don't have a driver's license or a state ID, then the secured party can use the individual name, which is really kind of like a nickname or their goes by name. So for me, my nickname is Liddy Dunsty, but my surname and first personal name is Lydia Christina Dunsty with lots of variations. Some people call me Lid, so, so that would be one of my individual names. Now, if we switch to alternative B, this particular alternative is a little bit harder on searching. It's called the individual's safe harbor rule, not to be confused with another safe harbor rule that I'll talk about later. This particular alternative allows the secured party to use several different options or variations in the individual's name. So they can choose the individual's name, like the nickname, Lid or Liddy, and my surname, which is Dusty, or they can use my first personal name and surname which is Lydia Christina Dunsty, or they can use the driver's license. So when you're looking at filing UCC1 against an individual, you're basically gonna have to say, you know, what is your surname? What is your first personal name? What are your nicknames? What do you go by? And, uh, or do you have a driver's license? And then you'll probably wanna be prudent and file a UCC1 against all of those name variations. And the way you can do that is there's an additional field in the UCC1 where you can add one name. And then you can also use the additional party form and add as many variations as you need to. Don't put those names on an exhibit. The filing office is not responsible for reading your exhibits. You have to put them in boxes so that they can be indexed so that the next person who's searching that individual will pick up any and all name variations as it relates to that individual. It never hurts to add additional names to the index, especially in this particular jurisdiction. Um, those, which alternative B states are there? Well, we're talking about Alaska, Colorado, that e-filing state, Connecticut, Delaware, New Hampshire, Oregon, and Wyoming. Remember, this is an individual debtor. We're not talking about UCCs on corporations or LLCs, but I do want to switch to that now. So let's talk about that. How do we figure out the name to put in box 1B or 1A for a corporation or an LLC or some other type of registered entity? If a debtor is a registered organization, the financing statement will only be sufficient if the financing statement provides the name that is stated to be registered on the public record of the most recently filed with or issued or enacted by the registered organization's jurisdiction 
of organization which reports to state, amend, or restate the registered organization's name. What do we mean by this? We really mean that you can't rely on a certificate of good standing. It's a good practice to go ahead and order the public formation documents from the state, as well as all amendments with the corporation. We're talking about the articles of incorporation or organization or the certificate of formation for an LLC. It has to be, again, those original documents. Just think organic is original. And for a non-registered entity, it would be the document required to create the entity. Carefully look at them. Sometimes we've seen where the public organic record has one name, but then if you look at, say, the operating agreement, there's a little bit of a variation in the spelling. Now, I have seen some practitioners put their belts and suspenders on and add those additional names to the UCC-1. That's going to be something that you as a firm or as a practitioner or as a secured party decide. Once again, the same way with individuals, it never hurts to over-notice, okay? The other thing to keep in mind, too, is ask if the entity has changed their name, and that's true with individuals, too. Have they changed their name in the past five years? And if so, do we want to conduct a lien search on those additional names or not? Why? Well, UCCs have a life, most of them, for five years, and if they've changed their names, over the past five years, it's possible there could be UCC filings with those prior names. Let's discuss where to file the UCC-1 and, of course, search for personal property. Generally speaking, you have to file the UCC-1 in the central filing office or equivalent of the location of the debtor. What are we talking about? If it's a registered organization, then that means that you're going to file at the jurisdiction of the debtor's organization. Where did they form? For non-registered entities, in general partners, partnerships in California are not registered, you look to the debtor's chief executive office. And with individuals, you look to the jurisdiction of the debtor's residence. Now, um, there's a couple variations of the central filing offices that I mentioned earlier, and, and you can look at the note here, there. If, by any chance, any of these locations seem ambiguous to you, especially in terms of the chief executive office or where someone lives, it doesn't hurt to also put your belts and suspenders on and add those additional um, locations to, you know, file in those other locations as well. In other words, it doesn't hurt to file two UCCs, one in California and one in Florida, if that person spends half and half their time there. Now for non-US debtors, it gets a little bit more complicated I'm um, really oversimplifying it here. I, I would suggest that you talk to counsel or you can always rely on a good service provider to, to guide you in a particular jurisdiction. But what you have to do is you have to determine the location of the chief executive office. And if that executive office is in the U.S., then you'll file and search there in the United States. If the chief executive office is in the other country um, with a UCC type system, which is its own set of uh, analysis there, then the filing rules of that country apply. I can tell you definitely Canada is one of those. Uh, if you have a Canadian debtor, Canada has a system that must be followed in order to, you know, make sure that you're securing or perfecting your security interest. And if the chief executive office is in a country that doesn't have a UCC type system, like um, maybe a, a country in Africa or something like that, then you would file in Washington, D.C., or actually Mexico is a good example because I've got a case about that now. So in this particular case, debtors were two individuals, growers of table grapes. They lived in Sonora, Mexico. Deca and Hackett were the first secured parties to agree to finance and sell the debtor's 2007 grape crop. This secured party filed a UCC-1 directly in D.C., um, and if you follow the analysis of the last slide, at the time, I would imagine that the lawyers knew that Mexico didn't have a system at that point, and, and that is a true story. Growers then failed to pay the secured party because 2007 was a bad year for grapes, so they defaulted on the 700 or so thousand dollar loan. Later, Del Monte, secured party two, 
comes into the picture, fails to do a search in DC, advances the growers the grape funds. They didn't know about the first lien that DECA had taken out in DC. They did a search in Sonora, Mexico, where the debtors were located or where they lived and um, didn't find any liens. So they went ahead and filed through a registry system in Mexico that didn't meet the test discussed earlier. Secured party one, DECA, informed Del Monte, hey, those crops, those 2,000 crops are ours and the proceeds are ours. Please give us the grapes and the money back. And they said no. So DECA sued them for conversion. The question was who had priority over the 2008 grapes and proceeds? Was it Secured Party 1 who filed the UCC in DC or was it Secured Party 2 who filed in the Public Registry of Commerce in Sonora, Mexico? And of course, the, one of the questions for the court was, does Mexico's law meet the requirements of Arizona's 9307 statute? The ruling was that Mexico did not meet the requirements and thus for the purpose of perfecting security interests, the debtors were located in the District of Columbia. Okay, e-filing. I just wanna cover this very quickly because we already kind of mentioned it before, but there's a couple benefits to e-filing and that is the speed and the cost. Um, there's a lot of resistance. I know many of you attorneys are uh, WYSIWYGs. In other words, you want to, what you see is what you get. You want the submission of the UCC to look exactly the same when it comes back as evidence. I think things are changing a little bit, um, especially because we've got so many states, those ones listed down there, that are mandatory e-filing states. And um, there are a couple ways that you can e-file. You can either go directly to the state if it's allowed. I don't think Delaware allows that, but um, the, the issue with this is it's kind of clunky uh, in terms of like opening separate accounts, having credit cards, logins, and then you've got to pay the credit card bill and so forth. Um, some of the jurisdictions, you, you're rekeying data from a draft that you already circulated to the different parties and so forth, so it could create risk. You can also use a third-party service provider that has technology, which has also an API with direct connect to the state. I just recently did a UCC one filing and couldn't believe it. it. Came back in like six minutes, literally. It was great. Um, what does it allow you to do? You can create drafts, you can bulk edit, bulk file, you can get your tickler system going if you don't have one already. And um, and I know that most of the time the the firms that I work for want their corporations to or their financial institution clients to tickle the lap state, but a couple of big firms are actually taking this on because the clients are demanding that they do so. So just something to kind of keep in mind. Here's some examples of rejected filings. Um, we're talking about it, using the incorrect form, paying the wrong fees, missing data, and uh, missing the debtor name, missing the secured party name. There's certain fields that are absolutely required to be indexed and the state will reject based on that purpose. Some people write UCCs by hand and uh, those, the print, it, print is illegible, and that, if that's the case, then the jurisdiction's going to reject it. So maybe you wanna add this to your checklist to think about before you file your UCC one. Here's some examples where the, the jurisdiction will actually take your filing and probably not reject it, but it doesn't mean that it's gonna hold up in court. And what are those reasons? Well, you may say, see exhibit A attached here too, and then you forget to attach the exhibit. That is a big, big problem because you have to have some kind of indication of the collateral. And we've seen cases where that has been litigated. Um, maybe boxes have been incorrectly checked. Or when you look at a UCC3, I just saw one last week where it was a, an e-filing and whoever filed it filed, uh, checked two boxes. They checked a termination and they checked an assignment at the same time. Well, you have to make sure that the record is clear for the next person who's filing. So that was gonna to have to be cleaned up by you know, the parties involved. Just because a jurisdiction accepts your filing does not mean that it is legally sufficient or correct. They will accept the wrong name and, and all those kinds of things, and then you end up in court, which is another reason why I say that that search to reflect is so important. Okay, so let's move on to searching. Um, it is a reasonableness standard. You have to make sure you do Further inquiry, if you need to when you're searching, balancing the risk with the time spent is always important. I Hopefully you've gotten that 
point to me. I've made that point earlier. Here's a checklist that you can use. Most of the issues are the same as the other checklist. Um, don't forget that, to ask if there is a broad-based search. Sometimes it's a good idea at the beginning of the deal to see that broad-based search, to see what's out there, even if someone else may have filed under the wrong name, for example. And I want to talk about a safe harbor. What is a safe harbor? Well, we, we know that there's a safe harbor all, under Alternative B, but this is a different kind of a safe harbor. What if you do make a mistake on the debtor name? Is there something that can help you? Is there a safe harbor? And yes, the answer is yes, there is. As long as a search of the records in the filing office under the correct debtor's, under the debtor's correct name using the filing office's search logic would have disclosed a financing statement, even though it's wrong, then it will not make it the filing seriously misleading. I suggest you read this on your own a little bit later. I want to show you a couple cases where it actually comes into play. And I purposely added Florida's specific state safe harbor statute because I want to talk about a safe harbor case. And this is a really important case. A lot of people have published uh, information on it. Maybe you've already heard of it. It's the Beach Boulevard case. It went up to the Supreme Court in Florida because um, the, the lower court, the 11th Circuit, wanted some clarification, they wanted some certified questions answered as to whether a financing statement that fails to correctly name the debtor is deemed effective under the safe harbor rule. Well, the problem with this particular case was that Florida did not actually have a standard search logic to begin with. Therefore, the, the court decided, you know, the Supreme Court decided, we're not even going to say whether or not the safe harbor applies because you didn't have a standard search logic that's required in the safe harbor. What did that mean for the secured party? Well, it meant that they are behind in the line with other secured parties that get to jump before them. And um, that's not a good situation in bankruptcy. They can't just go back and try to file a new UCC one on the same name when the bankruptcy has already ensued. What was the mistake that was made? Well, you can see it in yellow there. They abbreviated Boulevard, and Boulevard should have been spelled out. And so they did not, this search did not come out in the end. It didn't come out in the, the actual evidence. Now, there's a fact in the case that I thought was really interesting. When you're looking at the screen in Florida, apparently had they scrolled down a little bit, they would have seen the filing. But the, the court was saying, you know, we can't, put that much of a burden on the people searching if you don't even have a standard search logic to begin with. I use this case a lot, but I, I really like it. I, I, can't, I can't break up with this one. It's a case in Wisconsin, and it shows a little bit more about what it, what, what it means to be seriously misleading, all right, and the safe harbor. The secured party filed a UCC-1 in Wisconsin, the debtor on the debtor's name on the charter documents was ISC, Inc., but the secured, secured party filed it with a space between the C and the period. Believe it or not, a search trying to use the safe harbor using the search logic in Wisconsin did not provide for the filing. It didn't show up in the next person's search. In other words, you know, if this person had done a search to reflect, they would have seen that their filing wasn't there, but they didn't do that. Now, the reason I love this case is because this case never would have happened in California. California has what's called a broad-based search, and that means that um, they would drop off the ink when you ask for a search in that country. And ink is considered a noise word. If you haven't heard of noise words before, they're promulgated by IACA, but they're not, the states are not forced to adopt them. So. Florida didn't adopt them, Wisconsin didn't adopt them, and that means that you have to be very specific when you search, and you have to get it right, and also when you file, of course, too. So um, these are the words that are ignored at the end of the debtor name, and something to just kind of maybe print, be aware of. I don't think I put it in the materials, but you can certainly get it off of the California Secretary of State site don't know why, but I could not find it on the IACA site, so don't look for it there. 
but you can always print this particular copy too. Last but not least, I just want to mention that a post-filing search to reflect could have saved ISC secured party. What do I mean by that? Well, as I mentioned in phase four of the cycle of a secured transaction, we, the secured party, or the secured party's lawyer needs to ensure that they did in fact perfect the security interest. And that means making sure that the filing isn't seriously misleading. And had they waited to, through the through date, in other words, when the jurisdiction updates their records through the date of their filing, they could have ordered a search to reflect to see if any names were wrong, to see if the jurisdiction made a mistake, I've seen jurisdictions run three words together, and those types of liens don't end up showing up. Those problems could have been fixed, all right? The other thing about a post search to reflect is, what if your last lien search was January 1st, but your UCC wasn't filed till January 15th? It is possible that someone else could come in and could have come in and filed an intervening lien between the time that you ran your last search and the time that you filed your UCC-1, and you'll never know that. And then what happens is bankruptcy ensues. Now suddenly there's a fight between you and that intervening lien, and guess who's going to win? The person who was first in time, which is going to be the one who was before you. Okay? Well, that's all I've got for you today. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. If you have any questions, I hope that you feel free to give me a call anytime. Thank you. Thank you, Lydia. Before we conclude today's webinar, I would like to go over a few evaluation questions. The first, please rate the value of today's webinar content on a scale from one to five, where five is the highest and one is the lowest. Again, that is, please rate the value of today's webinar content on a scale from one to five, where five is the highest and one is the lowest. Moving on to our second evaluation question. Please rate today's presenter on a scale of one to five, where five is the highest and one is the lowest. Again, that is, please rate today's presenter on a scale of one to five, where five is the highest and one is the lowest. And moving on to our third question, please rate today's webinar, sorry, please rate today's written materials on a scale of one to five, where five is the highest and one is the lowest. Again, that is, please rate today's written materials on a scale of one to five, where five is the highest and one is the lowest. And moving on to our final question, please rate today's webinar technology on a scale from one to five, where five is the highest and one is the lowest. Again, that is, please rate today's webinar technology on a scale from one to five, where five is the highest and one is the lowest. Thank you for joining. This concludes today's live webinar. You may now disconnect.